the main focus of our collections up there uh, falls within what we call the Mississippi Valley Collection, and that is multi-format uh, collection of materials uh, documenting the history and culture of the lower Mississippi Valley region, which is a big, big part of the country, um, <clears throat> portions of southern states. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Beverly Bond, who has been a friend, a fellow graduate student, and a colleague here for probably more years than, than either of us would really want to, to pinpoint. Uh, we've, been, we've been around here a long time. Uh, I'd also would like you to uh, notice uh, when you leave that we do have an exhibit of uh, church material, church family materials. Uh, down on the, uh, on the first floor. Uh, Beverly is Associate Professor of History and Dunavant Professor of African American History at the University of Memphis. Uh, her current projects uh, include uh, working on uh, the anthology Tennessee Women, Their Histories, Their Lives. This would be Volume 2 uh, from the University of Georgia Press. Volume 1 came out about three or four years ago. Uh, she uh, has most recently cooperated with uh, Dr. Janan Sherman on uh, the history of the University of Memphis, uh, both the, the uh, large format uh, uh, book and the, uh, the photographic, uh, smaller format photographic uh, uh, history, uh, both of which drew extensively on the materials that we have in the Special Collections Department. Uh, she has. Uh, also working on a biography of Reverend Ello Taylor, uh, who was a, uh, a Memphis uh, pastor who was also a very talented uh, photographer and uh, filmmaker, uh, and uh, a book forthcoming, uh, or at least in progress, from the University of Illinois Press, Claiming Myself, African American Women in Memphis, Tennessee. 1820s to the early 1900s. I suspect that's a reworking of her <laughs> doctoral dissertation, uh, which focused uh, uh, on, on that topic. So uh, without further ado, I would ask you to welcome and listen closely uh, to her lecture, Help Me to Find My People, Researching the African American Past. Thank you. Oh, we're passing around a signage sheet. Uh, so if you would, if you're not on a list, and would like to get some email uh, updates about other programs that we'll be putting on, uh, please uh, sign in, uh, give your uh, name and email address. We promise we are, will not spam you with a bunch of stuff. Hmm. It's just that I say that. Uh, and, and if you're already getting the stuff that we sent out, you know, that, that's great too. So we're ready. Okay. Thank you. Well, I've been over here so many times doing these presentations, and I just want to let the group know this time that since I'm by myself, that I won't cut off another person's and, you know, go into their part of the program. And also, I don't have a lot of slides on the PowerPoint this time. I usually come with like 20 or 30 slides and never get through them. But this time, I decided to limit them because I'm going to talk about kind of a different fun topic. But it's a topic that does relate to a lot of the resources that are available in special collections, in the library, in government documents, just all over, as well as a lot of what's being done with online resources on African American, on research in the African American past. Um, this particular type of research that I've been doing is kind of like a little sidelight of you know, what historians do in their spare time. And that is that we sometimes delve into our own histories to try to see what kind of narratives we can create from our own life stories. Uh, life story, not my life story, because I'm not ready to stop and do a biography, but my family's life story, which goes back pretty far in Tennessee history, um, goes back pretty far in this whole Mississippi Delta region. Um, and this is really my base of research period for everything. As, uh, as um, Ed pointed out, I did my dissertation on uh, black women in 19th century, but it's 19th century Memphis. And it started out as a topic that <coughs> people generally said, well, you're not going to find anything on. And I think in a lot of ways this family history started out in the same way. Um, 
as most family histories do. And I'm going to try not to replicate a wonderful lecture that one of our African and African American Studies um, students did last week um, on African American genealogy. It was just an exciting lecture. And she had a full house of students who wanted to know more about how do you do this kind of research. So now I'm speaking to the researchers and the librarians to kind of let you know that there are students out there who are interested and who will probably be knocking on your doors to try to see what they can find. Okay, now the title for this lecture came from a book that I used with my graduate students last semester. And it's by Heather Williams. Um, it's called Help Me to Find My People, The African American Search for Family Lost in Slavery. Um, my students really enjoyed it. Uh, Heather Williams was also at the Southern Festival of Books in the fall. And I had an opportunity to meet her and introduce her, as well as another man who was doing um, the same kind, had done a lot of the same kind of genealogical research that I was doing. And they were both on the same panel. Heather Williams to talk about, you know, how does a historian put an imprint on this genealogical study? And the other gentleman, James Baker, to uh, just kind of let people know that this is what comes out of years and years of researching family history and research that started with just a picture in a textbook that turned out to be a picture of his family, his enslaved family, and then just grew into a book. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, I'm going to start with, I'm so glad this came out large enough, but I'm going to, I didn't want to take a chance, so I'm, <coughs> I'm going to focus on these two advertisements, but I'm going to read them to you. I'm not going to require that you kind of figure them out. Oops, I'm sorry, I knew this was going to happen. Okay, in the aftermath of emancipation, African Americans began looking for their families. Now, as Heather Williams pointed out, they had, in a sense, always been looking for these families. Um, slaves that, who were sold away from wives, children, husbands, um, parents, grandparents, felt a great sense of loss. And in some cases, whenever you had in newspapers uh, notices for runaway slaves, they would include information to say very simply that this person ran away and is probably somewhere in the vicinity of Germantown or Collierville or Memphis because the person has family in these areas. So there was this search for family constantly. But in the aftermath of emancipation, this search, these searches took on a different kind of meaning. And that was because you began to see slaves using the media, using newspapers, using um, letters that passed back and forth uh, to black churches that were um, developing all over the South um, to try to locate family members. Now, in this case, these two advertisements appeared in the Color Tennessean, which was published out of Nashville. And the first one says, um, is about information that's wanted. It was published on Saturday, October the 7th, 1865. Information wanted of Caroline Dodson, who was sold from Nashville November 1st, 1862, by James Lumsden to Warwick, a trader in human beings, who carried her to Atlanta, Georgia, and she was last heard of in the slave pen of Robert Clark, human trader in that place, from which she was sold. Any information on her whereabouts will be thankfully received and rewarded by her mother, Lucinda Lowry. And then, and of course, Lucinda lives in Nashville, or lived in Nashville. And then the second one, information wanted. Information wanted of my two boys, James and Horace, one of whom was sold in Nashville and the other was sold in Rutherford County. I myself was sold in Nashville and sent to Alabama by William Boyd. I should have looked at this a little more, but this is not any connection to me, to what we're going to talk about. I and my children belong to David Moss, who was connected with the penitentiary in some capacity. And then, of course, this is from Charity Moss, and she's asking that information be sent to a box office at the Color Tennessean. 
And then there's a third one that appeared um, a little bit earlier, uh, on Saturday, August the 12th. And this one said, Information Wanted, of Kizzy Dunn, who lived in Corinth, Mississippi in 1862, but I learned she left there in the fall of the same year from Memphis. She is my mother, and I would be glad to hear from her. I have a brother named Joseph Dunn, and I also have an uncle somewhere in that country. Any information respecting their whereabouts will be thankfully received. And that was signed by Levi Dunn. African Americans uh, searching for lost relatives have been searching throughout slavery, as I said before, for these lost relatives. And these searches just tended to broaden in the aftermath of the Civil War, probably because they felt there was more of a, a, a chance that they could reconnect. They were now free. And also because when you look at what did slave, what did freedom mean in the aftermath of the Civil War, in the aftermath of enslavement, freedom meant family. It meant connecting or reconnecting or recreating or creating family. So these searches for family members were a part of this statement of emancipation, the reality of emancipation. The sense of loss and the need to recreate have been very important themes in recent years. Now, all of us can think about Alex Haley's book, The Saga of an American Family, Roots, The Saga of an American Family. And that really stimulated a lot of interest in what slavery was like, but also in the need or the efforts of African Americans to try to trace their lineage. In some cases, trace this lineage all the way back to Africa. And there are all kinds of um, new techniques and strategies and, of course, the marvel of DNA, which have made this possible, in some cases, by African Americans today. Um, Alex Haley, though, did his connections and made his connections um, through family history and then just reading and then researching and, and going to libraries and looking at public documents and all of this. So probably if Alex Haley had you know, been able to use the all of the, the uh, tools that we have today, more than likely he would have made these connections much, much earlier. He probably would have just gone to Ancestry.com and plugged in a few names and saw all these little green flags, pop, leaves rather, pop up all the way through the search. And he would have gotten that book out much, much sooner. But he got it out anyway. Um, James Johnston published another book a few months ago, maybe a few years ago, entitled From Slave Ship to Harvard, about uh, the other part of the title is Yarrow Mama, Mammoth, and the History of an African American Family. Now, a lot of people are familiar with the photograph, or the portrait, rather, of Yarrow Mammoth. Uh, it has appeared in African American history textbooks ever since I've been teaching the subject. And this is the picture, sorry, this is the, the portrait, rather, of an a Muslim slave who was captured in Guinea, brought to the United States as a slave. Now, what Johnston has done, and I'll have to read from the description of, of the book, um, it says, the author has reconstructed a unique narrative from paintings, photographs, books, diaries, court records, legal documents, and oral histories. And this narrative is about an educated Muslim enslaved in Guinea, brought to Maryland on the slave ship Elijah, who gained his freedom 44 years later through the efforts of Robert Turner Ford. Sorry, and it carries on through a look at his descendants down to 1927, um, and one descendant, Robert Turner Ford, who graduated from Harvard. So this is a really broad study of a character that probably we're all of us familiar with from the textbook. And if you have never seen this, uh, this portrait of um, Yara Mahmoud, um, then I would just suggest you take an African American history course and I'm using a textbook that has this photograph in it and Dr. Sadler is probably using some book that also has a, a picture of Mahmoud in that. Um, the third book that I'd like to mention is the one um, that I met this man at the, um, so the Southern Festival of Books along with Heather Williams. And that's James Baker, and the title of his book is The Ties That Bind, 
slavery, identity, and family. Now, what had happened with, um, with Baker was that he was a young boy, a young student, and, and just happened to open up a textbook, and there was a picture of some slaves on what was called the Westington Plantation. And he had lived near this plantation and near this area all of his life, and then someone in his family just happened to mention, well, you know, those are your relatives, those are your ancestors. And this led him on this long search for the Washingtons of Westington Plantation, for his ancestors, a long, successful search. He lives in Nashville, so if at some point um, you'd like to bring him down to talk about his book, he would be more than happy to do so. And then, of course, Heather Williams. Um, whose book I was using in my class. And one of the things that I like about Heather Williams' book is that she explores not just the fact of these separations, but the feeling of the separations. Um, she uses a term that my graduate students and I talked about quite a bit, and that was the idea of ambiguous loss, to try to figure out or to try to explain what did it feel like for slaves who were separated from each other. Uh, for mothers who were sold away from children, from wives who were sold away from husbands. What was the aftermath? What was the feeling like? And then to use that idea to kind of generate an understanding or a question about why these searches are taking place. Now, she defines ambiguous loss, and she's using this in a, in a psychological framework. But the idea that this is a kind of loss that is uncertain. Um, a disappearance in which those left behind or those taken away remain unaware of the whereabouts or, or the status of loved ones. And there's the suggestion that this kind of loss is actually worse than the uncertainty of, than the certainty of death because you really don't know what happened to that person. All right, so keeping that in mind, she's explaining why these ads were so important. Why is this effort to reconnect after the Civil War, or whenever you could? Um, because that sense of loss never left a person. After 20, 30 years, you still wondered, where was grandmother? What is she doing? We've been separated. I remember that, um, I remember, you know, when we were in Maryland, I played at her feet and I did this, but then all of a sudden, she was gone. So it's an ambiguous loss that is taking place. And that generates a lot of the searches for these, these members of family. Um, some other books that are also important, and one in particular. I had the joy of reading this book. I don't know if any, how many people have read this? It's called Freeman, and it's by Leonard Pitts. If you haven't read it, it is fantastic. Um, Leonard Pitts takes the same approach to why are people searching, or the search that, that African Americans were going through in the aftermath of slavery. But he does it as a novel. And he has three main characters, two of whom are really important for the discussion of you know, what's going on with these, these searches. One is um, an escaped slave who's worked for the Union Army, uh, has made it to Philadelphia um, after he's been injured and everything, and he's kind of recovered and he's living in Philadelphia. And then the Civil War ends. And even though he has this safe, secure life in Philadelphia, working as a respected uh, person in an establishment, he decides as soon as he hears that the war is over, that he's going to pack up everything and go on this journey down into Mississippi, down with Tennessee and then Mississippi, looking for his wife. And this was a wife that he had been separated from for 15 years. And the reason for the separation was not a happy one. Uh, they had had one child together. And somehow in conversations um, around the, you know, the fireplace or whatever, um, the Freeman, which is the name that he adopts after the war's over, Freeman had talked quite a bit about escaping, about freedom. And his young son heard him and believed him. And when Freeman decided that he was finally going to escape, 
His wife tried to talk him out of it. She said, you can't get away. We've got a good life here. Um, the mistress is really kind to us. Uh, she's taught us how to read and write and all of this. But he says, but that's not enough. I have to escape. And the boy says, I'm going with you. And in the process of this escape, the boy is killed. And, his, and they're captured. Uh, Freeman is captured, brought back, and whipped, and then sold. And his wife just could never forgive him. Um, so she's, he doesn't know what happened to her. There's the ambiguous loss. You know, what, not only what have I done in killing her only child, uh, doing something to lead to his death, but also what happened to her. And then there's the other side of the story where Pitts is actually telling what happened to Tilda, which is a very interesting part. And then there are other characters who you begin to see what is happening to people, to black and white people, in the South in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, what happens when slavery ends? Is it that easy for people to give up property that they had invested so much in? All right. And that's, that's a part of what this story is about. So I would thoroughly recommend this. If you have a book club, have them read this. There's great discussions on this. And then finally, of course, there is Django, um, which I, I saw because I knew that my students would want me to comment on it, which they haven't, and I'm really surprised. Or would ask me, you know, can I go see this for extra credit? And I decided, you know, after I saw it, that, yeah, they might, I might say, yes, you could go to see it, but only if you could explain the context of that search. What is going on? Not, you know, Tarantino violence and blood and all of this, but what's the search about? You know, what, what's going through Django's mind? Why does he, you know, want to risk everything just to, on this impossible quest to find his wife? Haven't had anybody to ask, but if you know any of my students, just let them know. She'll say yes if you can explain that. Okay, so getting back to how, how you do the searches and then what can you find. Um, I decided, I guess about, well, several years ago, that I would try to do some family history. And it started out in a class on this campus on family. And one of the projects was that you could do a family history. And I said, oh, okay, that's going to be a little difficult. So I did what everybody should do to start this. And that is to start where you are. You know, ask questions of the people around you. And I had missed some of the very important people who could probably tell me a lot about family history um, because they had died. So I had to just start with whoever was there. And I got a little bit of family history. And, you know, that kind of motivated, motivated me to move on. So I did the familytree.com thing, and then I moved on to ancestry.com. And I stuck with them for several reasons. Um, number one, because I can use them to do my own research, you know, just plug in, not my family members, but just people I want to know about and pull up all the information on them. And then number two, um, I think mainly because that's a growing digital format. And they keep adding a lot of these records that are so critical to any historian who is doing this research. The census records, as soon as they go up real population census. And I was so thrilled when I opened them up the other day and you know, do, going back again to do some research. And I realized that they had not only put the 1850 and 1860 census, but they put the slave census up there, which is even more important. You know, it's okay to have you know, the names of who are the people and who's living here and all of this, but the thing that's really important to historians of this period is that you need to see the households where the slaves lived. Um, in most cases, the slave population is an anonymous, except for um, sex, color, age, um, how many houses are there on this planter's plantation. They're pretty anonymous. But you can use that to go a little bit deeper for family history, and you can use it to also give you a feel for what slavery was like in terms of the numbers. And you can put that with the agricultural records, and you can see 
a little bit on what's being produced and how much of it is being produced and you know where are people in all of this. So um, I like Ancestry.com and they have some fantastic records up there now. Um, the U.S. Colored Troops, those you know the soldiers from the Civil War, they have records of those soldiers as well as um, all of the other military records all the way through World War II. I don't think they've done Korea, but I have to check again, but I don't think they have. But that's, those are valuable records for 20th century historians. Um, some other important sites have come up. As more and more African Americans have gotten into doing genealogy, uh, there's a site called Afrogenesis, which is really good. Uh, there's Fold 3, which does mostly military records. So there are all of these sources out here. And if you want to do a little more digging, sometimes you run into this kind of blank wall, this huge wall, and you can't find people, and you don't know where they are and what they're doing. And then you just say, well, I need to come over to the library and look, in the case of Memphis, in the city directories. In doing um, my genealogy, I couldn't remember, because I was just a kid, I couldn't remember when my grandfather died. But I just, and then I couldn't find a death certificate or anything. I said, well, and I don't know how that happens in Memphis, but it did. Unless maybe he didn't die in Memphis, but I've got to explore that further. Uh, so I came over to the library and looked in the city directories in special collections, and of course, there was the reference. Um, my grandfather died maybe in 1955, because the next year my grandmother referred to herself as a widow. So, you know, that's pretty obvious there. Okay, um, there are, of course, some extensive family collections, uh, African-American family collections, and we have one of the best of these collections in the collection, the papers of the church family. Uh, if any of you, I'm sure most of you in the library have taken a look at them, and as uh, Ed pointed out, there is an exhibit downstairs on the first floor in the lobby of some of the papers, but that is one of the richest collections of documents and artifacts and papers and letters, everything is just fantastic. And to show you how long I've been here, Ed, I can remember when you had to have that little permission. You know, was it was it um, was it Charles Crawford that had no the lawyer who had to sign that you could take a look at the papers. So that was a pretty long time ago. Now you can just go upstairs and take the finding guide and look at whatever you want to look at, but. There were restrictions at one point. All right, now using all of these, this information, I decided that I would kind of take the rest of this time and tell you a little bit about one of my ancestors that I've been able to find information on. Because I think when you look at something like genealogy, um, it's, you know, your audience kind of gets glassy-eyed when you're talking about documents. Historians love documents, but, you know, other people are like, yeah, well, okay, you know, so she's really happy about finding this piece of paper, but what else is there? So I decided I would step back and let you see what you could do with these documents and what kind of information you can find out. And I decided that I would not go, not show you the easy people my mother, my father, all of these people, you know, that's, it's not too hard to tell you what I've been able to find out about them because most of it is memory and I have an aunt who's still living and she's a, a wealth of information. Um, I decided to go back to one of the earliest people, you know, at the very top of the family tree, or, you know, at the top of the family tree. Um, but one that I thought that I would never be able to find out a lot about, and there's still a kind of a wall. I've hit the wall of slavery. I just am not going to let that stop me. So I have to kind of push further and then at some point just look at the document and say, this is what the document is telling me. Now, it may not be true, but until I find something else, I'm just going to keep going in this direction. And then maybe, you know, Five years from now, somebody will say, well, you know, we found the family Bible, and that's not the person that you're looking for. So I'll just back up and start all over again. But for right now, I'm going to keep going where I'm going. Okay. So this is the person, and I think I probably should turn this out. This 
was a very poor quality photograph that I had to deal with. And I have to say, I'm guessing that this is who this is. But I have several reasons for thinking that it is. Number one, this was a very valued family portrait of this person. Um, my uncle gave me this portrait along with another one of my grandparents from my turn of the century, uh, just before he died. And he knew that, you know, I'd come down from New Jersey every year, and he would, you know, I'd say, well, Uncle Boyd, uh, how's the portrait? And he would say, well, it's still hanging there. I said, well, just remember, um, don't give it away. I want them. So just before he died, the Christmas before he died, he brought these two portraits over. One was the portrait of my grandparents, and the other was this one, which was in really poor shape. I, this portrait is actually in pieces, so like a jigsaw puzzle, I had to put it back together. And then I, I just decided the other day that I would take a photograph of it, a digital photograph, and um, bring it to a, another colleague on campus who does some photographic history, Dr. Jenkins and see what she can do. Well, she hasn't gotten it yet. But this morning I was sitting there and said, well, I need this photograph for this presentation. So I had it on um, iPhoto. I said, hmm, what does that mean about redoing or touching or something, retouching? So I started playing around with it. And I got that little erase thing. <laughs> and I just discovered I could erase a lot of the scratches. So I've learned another technique too here. I'm really getting into the digital age. When we did Memphis in Black and White and Beale Street and University of Memphis, Dr. Sherman and I learned how to do scanning. <laughs> and we learned what happens when you don't do the settings right. And you have to rescan, scan again. So this was this is a work in progress. And I think the next time you see it, he'll probably look even better. But I have I think that this is the person that we're going to focus on, Richard Boyd, um, my great-grandfather. And I think that because it was such, I think I, I have this feeling because it was such a treasured portrait, but also, and I'm going to try to get Dr. Um, Jenkins to help me do this, because of the, the photography. Uh, this is during that period where this is before color photographs, so people just kind of colored photographs. So I have to work from that. Um, the suit, you can't really see the shirt, but it's a little bit different from, it's not the regular suit and tie. Um, the, even the, um, the style of the beard, you know, the, the way that it's trimmed, I really think that this is probably from the late 1800s. And I think that because this was such an important person in the family. You know, everybody didn't get their picture taken. Um, and as I said before, I have only those two, one of my grandparents and this one. And um, I kind of think that this is who it is. I think my, I remember my, my uncle saying that this, this is Richard Boyd. Richard Boyd. The only problem is that in my family, I don't know about yours, but names are recycled. There's Richard Boyd. There's Richard Boyd Jr. There is Richard Boyd Green, who is my uncle. Uh, because there were no other sons in the next generation or whatever, they kind of moved over in terms of the names they used. But, you know, this constant repetition of the names over and over again. So I think this is who this is. It also has, you know, the repetition of names has also led to some other little questions about uh, where he's coming from. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Okay. Um, Richard Boyd, or Richard Dick Boyd, because I also have to look for the nickname as it's used in some public records of that. He was born on August 21st in 1853, most likely in Hardeman County. Now, I say most likely um, because until a few weeks ago, I thought he was born in Haywood County. Because there are a lot of Boyds in Haywood County, so I'm like, oh, well, he must be from there. And they lived in Haywood County. And then I went back and I really looked at a funeral program for his youngest daughter, who was the last surviving daughter. And on her funeral program, 
when she was talking about her parents, she said Hardeman County. And I was like, okay, well nobody else ever said where he was born. It was just the assumption that it was Haywood County. So I went back and I said, okay, I'm going to put in Hardeman County and work from there. Okay, um, most of the census takers describe Richard as a mulatto. And I have this one photograph uh, passed on to me, uh, which seems to indicate that that was probably true. Uh, the family also, as I said before, recycled the name, so I know that there's a pattern there. If Richard was a slave in Hardeman County, he, was most, he most likely belonged to William Hughes or John C. Boyd. William Hughes was an Irishman who settled in Hardeman County, um, married a widow by the name of Mary Murrow Boyd, who was the widow of Anderson Boyd. And the Mary and Anderson Boyd had come to the state in the 1830s. Um, then Anderson Boyd died in 1841. By 1850, um, Mary Boyd had remarried um, to William Hughes. And William Hughes was a pretty prosperous man. He had about $18,000 in real estate and 40 slaves. Or, there's another way this could have worked out. Maybe the money in the slaves, the real estate in the slaves, had actually belonged to Anderson Boyd, and then to his wife, and then, of course, William gets to use all of this when he marries the widow Boyd. So there's a lot of different historical ways that this could play out. I still need to do a little more digging, but I'm going to have to take a look at Hardeman County property records, or wills, and that's taken me a little bit further than I can do right now and still work. In any case, um, Mary, uh, the household, the Hughes household in 1850 consisted of Mary and William, uh, their two children, Napoleon and Mary. Napoleon was four, Mary was two. And then Mary's three sons from her previous marriage. And guess what? Their names were John C., Richard, and Robert. John C. was 17, um, and he was usually listed as his occupation in, in 1850 as a clerk, uh, meaning probably he was learning how to keep up with all of this plantation records and read and write and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Richard was 13, and Robert was 10. Now, these are not African Americans. They are the white members of the household, but the children seem to have been named, and this is pretty common. Uh, this was not a slave household where children were given all kinds of unusual names. They were just given the names of their owners. This is Richard, this is young Richard, this is Richard, uh, this is Robert, this is young Robert. So they just kind of repeated the names over and over again. By 1860, William and Mary Hughes have died. And John C. Boyd is now in control of the plantation, or the farm. He's 27 years old. He's recently married to a 17-year-old young wife. Um, but according to the records, which look at here, I don't know whether you can really see them. Here's John C. Boyd, and these are the slave records. These are the slaves and the household that he owns. Okay. Um, in the other regular census, it just simply says that he has $18,000 in real estate, which obviously is the same $18,000 from before, and $30,000 in personal property. Now, if you look at the slave census, and this is where I try to figure out, okay, if this is Richard's, this is where he came from, who is he? Well, I know that he was born in 1853. They didn't name the slaves. They just give you the, um, you know, their ages, uh, their sex, and their color. So I have to try to figure this out. And it's a little difficult to see, but here you have a five-year-old mulatto, a uh, male mulatto. Uh, down here you have a six-year-old male mulatto. There was one more. Than but I think those are the only two that may be listed there. So the ages kind of fit. You know, they're close enough. The household seems to fit, okay? Even, you know, as far as the mother, 
I don't know. There are three possibilities up here. Okay, these three women. One is 33, one is 25, one is 26. Uh, this woman is a little bit older. I think she's 57. So I can eliminate her. But the other three, they kind of fit. That's all I can ever know. Where does she come from? Well, in some later census records, two census records, uh, Richard mentions that his mother came from Maryland, which was kind of unusual because everybody else in the family, including the family in which um, one of his daughters marries, my grandmother, came from North Carolina. And if you um, know about Tennessee history, of course, that's pretty logical because Tennessee was at one time part of North Carolina. So you have the movement of slaves out of North Carolina across into Tennessee, and from East Tennessee across into, across into the middle and the western portions, or down through Alabama and then back up to Tennessee. So that part seems to fit. Okay, um, let me see. Okay, now as far as who is the father, you know, that's an even bigger question. And I think that we pretty much all know as far as slavery is concerned. Um, we know what happened to slave women. We know about the, the mixing of races and everything. We know that when a person is described as a mulatto, it doesn't necessarily mean that the immediate parents included one white parent, um, most likely a male. It means simply that the census taker looked at this person and said, they appear to be the product of racial mixing, so they must be mulattoes. So Richard's father could have been maybe John C. I don't know. He's 27. Uh, he would have been 20 when Richard, 20, 21, 22, when Richard was born. Uh, could have been his brother. Um, sorry, John. Could have been his brother Richard, who would have been 24 in the 1866 census. Or it could have been his brother Robert. Or it could have been somebody on a surrounding plantation. Or it could have been one of the male slaves who was listed as a mulatto. Okay, again, I don't know. And if I had the family history to tell me, that would help, but I don't. So I have to kind of say, this part is just full of all of these what ifs, or these questions. Okay. Um, in any event, this history takes a kind of a strange twist during the Civil War. And it's a strange kind of funny twist that I haven't really figured out where to put it. And that is that I wanted to know what happened to John C. and his brothers during the Civil War. And I figured, well, okay, obviously they're slaveholders. They wouldn't join the Confederate Army or something like that. So I started looking, Ancestry.com, looking for the, you know, the military records. And then up pops John C. And I am so happy. I can say, okay, I put this to rest. And it's a burial record. And John C. and his brother Richard um, were buried. And I, I found this because it was attached to something else. It's not something that I kind of created. They were buried in the Nashville National Cemetery. And I'm like, hmm, no, I don't think they buried Confederates in the Nashville National Cemetery. So I opened up the record, and then I really got a shock um, because John C. and his brother Richard both died in 1864, a few months apart, and they are both listed as privates in the USCT. I'm like, no, that doesn't quite follow. How many people know what the USCT is? Colored troops. Yes, colored troops. And I'm like, well, somebody made a huge mistake. Huge, um, but I'm going to have to try to find something on this, uh, and I can't find any um, registration or draft records or anything as to showing when they enrolled in the troops, but just that they were buried as privates in the U.S. colored troops, both of them. The younger brother is still, you know, listed on a different set of census records, and I think they do list him with the Confederate Army, but. It's a little surprising here. Family history can be amazing. Okay, so what did, let's just say that this is Richard Boyd, young Richard Boyd. 
When the Civil War ended, he would have been 12 years old. So what happens to him? Well, I don't think he wandered looking for, trying to rec reconnect with family. And I don't think this because there were so many, he, he tended to, excuse me, to remain in the same area. So he's, you know, if you look at the counties that he has lived in, or his family lived in, Haywood, Tipton, um, Shelby, Hardeman, um, there are so many Boyds, Williams, Greens, Bonds, Walkers, which are family names in those areas. I think they were surrounded by family or extensions of family. Uh, Bond is my married name, so that's another side of the family, and they've already done a lot of their family trees, so I just copy theirs. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, but what I did find was that in 1876, um, he's now known as Dick Boyd, found a marriage certificate for Dick Boyd and Gracie Walker, who was my great-grandmother. Um, and hers was the one line that I could pretty much trace all the way through. She's either listed as Susan Walker, Susan Gracie Walker, or Gracie Walker. One of those three names, all the way through. So in 1875, he marries. By 1880, he's listed on the census. There's Richard, Susan, and their first four children. Um, and it's impossible just for you to read those names. But they are, at that point, um, Elnora, Addie Jane, John, and Lois. And they are between the ages of one month, Addie Jane, I'm oh, sorry, Lois, and five years. And there's also another child living in the household, and her name is Susanna Walker. Uh, so she would have been, obviously, Susan's, um, her sister. I'm sorry, no, she's not listed as sister. Uh, she's given some other title, but she would have been list, listed as a niece. That's how she's listed. So I'm like, okay, so here's Susan Walker, who is Susanna Walker, the sister of Susan Walker, who is a niece. And then I looked over a little further to try to find who was her father. And for that, um, who was Susan Walker's father? Uh, for that, I had the benefit of death certificates. And her father was George Walker. And her mother's name was Susan. So again, this repetition of names. But it, it gets a little bit stranger, even. Um, George and Susan Walker obviously had three daughters who lived to adulthood. There was Susan Gracie. There was Phyllis, who was listed on their census record. And then there was another daughter who died somewhere in this, and Susanna was her daughter. And in George and Susan Walker's household at this time, there were three children. Uh, this child's name is Susan Beasley, I'm sorry, Susanna Beasley. And in the Walker household, there were the other Beasley children. There was Susanna's twin sister, Susan, who was also eight. There was an older brother, Doc, D-O-C-K, and then there was a younger sister, Winnie. So you can kind of see how these connections are coming together based on the census. Now I'm going to move through the rest of this very quickly. Okay, by 1900, the family has moved to Shelby County. And they're living in this little community called Kerrville, which is right on the Shelby Tipton County border. In fact, if you look at some modern maps, it looks almost like the community is situated in both of those counties. Okay, it's a little kind of strange. Um, but that's where they are at this point. And in 1900, the older children who had been there in the 1880 census, they're no longer in the household, but there's a whole new set of younger children there. And Laura, my grandmother, is one of those younger children. Um, that census record, you could probably see the family at that point. It's this group. All right, now they're living in, in the 1880s, uh, sorry, 1890s. They're living in Kerrville. Kerrville has a very interesting history. In 1894, there was a very brutal, horrible lynching that was connected with Kerrville, uh, where a Shelby County detective or policeman or whatever went up to Kerrville, which was in Millington, whatever, in Tipton County, on that border. 
he went up there to arrest some black men who had been charged with barn burning. And he had warrants for six men. He couldn't find all of them, so he just arrested another man just to, you know, fill out the six so he'd have six. And he put them in a wagon and was bringing them back to Memphis. And somewhere between Memphis and Kerrville, um, there was this lynching. And all six men were killed, horribly killed. They were literally just shot to pieces. And um, the, the detective who was bringing them back said, well, OK, it's, it was because I was hit by a lynch mob. They just attacked me. And then they found out eventually that it wasn't a lynch mob. It was probably just maybe three or four men. So this trial played out for like months in the Memphis newspapers um, because they did put the, the men on trial. And they did accuse them of murder. And there was some leading citizens from Kerrville and Millington. Um, but they eventually found them innocent. And people like um, Julia Hooks and um, Ida B. Wells, they commented on this. I think this is the one where Ida B. Wells makes the reference that it's not this one, then it's the one, the one before that that every African-American family needed to have a rifle under their beds to protect themselves. And Julia Hooks encouraged, well, they had a big rally to collect money for the men's families. And Hooks, Hooks encouraged the, um, the people of Memphis to pay their poll tax, the men to pay their poll taxes and vote. So, you know, all of this whole period is when, it's a very turbulent period in Shelby County history in the city as well as in the county, the outlying rural areas. Okay, now, moving along. Um, this is another tool that I was able to find. In Millington, there's a church, St. James, there was a church, St. James CME Church, and they have a cemetery up there. And there's been a project in Tennessee and in other parts of the country to transcribe the tombstones. Um, and on the tombstones, through the tombstones in St. James Cemetery, um, you see Richard and Susan Gracie Boyd. Uh, it tells me a little more about them. Um, I knew from one of my grandmother's sister's um, obituaries that my grandmother was very active in the organization of this church. She was very, very much involved with it. Uh, just about I mean, this is only a small number of the graves that are in that cemetery, but every time I come across a, a obituary or a death certificate uh, for their family, there would be a reference to the person being taken, being buried in St. James Cemetery. So even though I don't see the names up there, I see um, Richard and Susan's daughter, Lois, um, but you know the others are in some way connected as relatives. But there are many more of the family who are buried there. And I also see that Richard Boyd was a Mason, um, as was one of his sons, who is not listed here, uh, my uncle Lewis Boyd, or Eugene Boyd. Um, he was also a Mason. So I'm hoping that if I can track down this Masonic connection, maybe I can find out a little bit more about Richard Boyd. Maybe it's somewhere they'll tell me, he'll tell me that this is my mother's name. Because all I know at this point is that, you know, she was from Maryland. And still, for, for his father, he always says, um, there's always the listing of DK, which when I first started this, I didn't know what that meant. But it means don't know. You, know. you see this over and over again on death certificates. Don't DK for the mother or the father. They don't know who the person was. All right. Some of the other sources, these are some death certificates that have been very important. This is Addie Jane Boyd. Uh, you saw her on the 1880 census. You see down here, Richard and Susan. And here it says Hardin County, but it's really Hardeman County. Um, the signature, the informant, is Maddie Boyd, who was um, Richard and Susan's youngest daughter. Okay. And then over here, Eudora Green. Richard and Susan's, another one of their daughters, who was listed as Dora. Now this was another surprise because I, I kept seeing Dora Green, Dora Boyd, I'm sorry, I see Laura Boyd Green and my grandfather Felix Green living, next, living together with their children. And then in 18, 1900 census, or 1910 census, next door to them were Eudora Green and Felix Green. 
So I was like, who is this? You know, I thought that Felix Green and my uncle, uh, sorry, my grandfather Elias Green, I thought they were brothers, but I didn't know who Dora was, or who Dora was. So until I pulled up her death certificate, and then I saw that she was the daughter of Richard and Susan. And I knew that this was the right one because my uncle had signed the death certificate. Boy Green, my uncle, signed her death certificate. He also signed her husband's death certificate, Felix Green. And the funny thing about them, um, you notice that she dies of cirrhosis of the liver. I think he died of cirrhosis of the liver about two years later. And this was probably just after the great, you know, the 1920s. So I think they were maybe making a little bit of bathtub gin and enjoying it too, and it wasn't a healthy thing for them. Uh, so learn all these nice little family secrets. This is my grandmother. Um, she loved her plants. That's one of the things I remember most about her. And again, death notices can be very important. I think this was something that um, the student, Tiffany, mentioned last, last week, was that, you know, these funeral programs like this, this is from my Aunt Maddie, another one of the daughters, Richard's daughters. Um, this is from her funeral program talks about her joining St. James CME Church, um, talks about the family, she was a baby in the family, and you know, all of these little points that you can kind of pull together to do the family history. So, I think that is it. Let me turn this light back up.